Okay, so um, I'm going to try this uh, streaming with. Okay, with, uh, so. Um, sorry about that. So, well, to motivate my uh, uh, discussion here, I'm going to try to make these videos using live streaming on YouTube. And so, hopefully, there won't be too many glitches. Uh, if it doesn't work well, I'll go back to the old ways to do it, but I'm going to just try this one. Okay, so what I want to talk about today is uh, in the first chapter, they present these eight general steps of performing a finite element analysis, and I'm going to cover those in a little more detail, at least give my spin on them. All right. Uh, so the first step, which the book doesn't explicitly state, but which, which I do think is very important is this I'll call it step zero so I can uh, stick it in there is basically um, define uh, or at least put down what are your modeling assumptions okay so this is the step where we have to describe what physics we really need to correctly solve the problem or describe the problem right every problem involves large, you know, finite deformation, nonlinear materials, temperature change, dynamics, but very often we can ignore a lot of these things. For example, if things move very slow, you know, we can ignore the dynamics of the problem. If uh, the loads are such that the stresses stay in the elastic range, we don't have to worry about plasticity, right? If basically the problem is uh, isothermal, we don't have to solve heat conduction. Although even when you do elastically deform a solid, a certain uh, there is a certain bit of reversible thermal energy that goes into there. So, you know, uh, these are assumptions we do to make the problem more trackable. So you always have to really think about this. Now, uh, that being said, we won't cover it too much in this class how to go about doing this, but really you always have to talk about that. Okay. Uh, even though you know a lot of times we um, uh, these assumptions are done by virtue of which solver we select to use, right? And you still need to think of it explicitly, okay? And if you only have a certain number of finite element solvers available to you, uh, and you, you know, you at least have to recognize that maybe you're compromising your results by using some uh, modeling assumptions that maybe aren't the most appropriate, but you're doing it so that you can, you know, solve it with the software that you have, all right? All right. Okay, the first step, as discussed in the textbook, is um, let's bring it down up to here, is to discretize and select the element type. Okay, so this is actually a a, a, uh, a really significant uh, amount of effort in developing a finite element model. Um, basically, breaking it up into its elements. Okay, that is the discretization process. So, for example. It's a little hard to see here, but imagine there's this sort of solid angle bracket, okay? So what we mean by this is we have to sort of, in this particular case, we selected the element type to be these shell elements, which, you know, we'll talk about a little later on, but these are two-dimensional elements that are supposed to idealize bending in, in, in three dimensions, like a, 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 a thin shell. Okay, and maybe they're appropriate for this bracket. So we've selected that type of element. And then we've taken the geometry and broken it up into the elements as shown here, right? Uh, so we have to choose what type of element we're gonna use and also choose you know, the actual mesh we're gonna employ. Maybe you can get away with a coarser mesh, maybe you need a finer mesh, as we'll talk about later on in the class, sometimes the mesh, you know, might have distortions, but you know, this is the step we have to do here. So basically, takes the real world problem. I don't have anything that looks like that. Maybe, you know, something like this per se, right? Let's imagine that's our bracket, right? And taking the actual geometry, often from CAD, and then abstracting it to this set of elements. Okay, so that's the first step. All right. Now, when we do um, this step, let's just talk about this very briefly. There are actually a lot of different elements we can use. And this is just going to go over a couple elements relatively quickly. So elements can be broken up into um, the dimension that they exist in. So we can either talk about problems in 1D 
2D or 3D. Now, obviously, everything is, is three-dimensional, but a lot of times things happen in a plane. We might want to consider like a truss, or sometimes every, things are just in tension, and maybe a one-dimensional physical problem will be sufficient, okay? Now, also, when we consider the dimensionality of the problem, there's actually also the dimension of the element, okay? So a one-dimensional element in one-dimensional space is just uh, a line element, okay? Like a, a, a bar element, okay? A spring element. Uh, a one-dimensional element in two dimensions is going to be a truss or a beam. And again, in three dimensions, it's going to be like a truss or a beam structure. So it might be something that looks like, you know, in three dimensions, it might look like I can draw something. Right, this is supposed to be sort of three-dimensional looking, right? And then I won't be able to draw it, but you know, you get the idea, right? So we have some sort of three-dimensional truss, okay? Those would all be discretized by one-dimensional elements. Now we also have two-dimensional elements. Obviously, you can't have two-dimensional element in one-dimensional space, but in 2D space, this is going to be plane stress or plane strain. We're going to talk about that in Chapter 6. And in three dimensions, this will be a plate or a shell. So that's similar to the picture I drew previously, right? And then obviously, we can have three-dimensional elements that can only exist really in three-dimensional space. These are going to be tetrahedra or hexahedra. Sometimes we use pentahedra elements, but these are the two major elements we use there, okay? So this is what I mean. We're, we have to... As an, as an analyst, we have to make an intelligent decision and choose the correct element for the problem, okay? So that's uh, step one, all right? All right, step two. Now we get a little bit more, um, a lot of these steps coming up are actually going to be, in a sense, done for us when we use a can find element package, like Abacus or, or Ansys or Nastran or something like that. But... Uh, let's go over the mathematics of it because it's kind of important for this class anyway. All right, so we're going to describe how the displacement is represented by the element. What's the displacement field in type inside this element? So if you imagine in two dimensions, let's say we're going to make a two-dimensional element, every point in this two-dimensional space can move either in X or Y, right? So it can be represented by a vector with an X and a Y component. And again, the amount that it moves in X and Y is going to be a function of position. So each point in this plane can move a different amount in X and a different amount in Y. So the displacement fields U and V are functions of position, X and Y, inside the element. All right. Now, so for example, here we have a uh, X displacement. It's in terms U, in terms of X and Y. And we have three nodes so we actually have three values we can use to interpolate like a, a, a nodal value here at the first node second node and third node we denote that as u1 u2 and u3 so we could express the displacement as a polynomial of this form and I won't go through the derivation here but suffice to say this is actually the appropriate polynomial to interpolate a linear displacement field inside this element okay likewise for the y displacement, although obviously uh, these shouldn't be used, these should be these. Okay, it's a little typo there. Pen dot. You need a new pen. So those U's there, they should be V's, right? Because obviously at each node we can have a, a U and a V, all right? I know I'm going a little fast on this stuff, but you know we'll, we'll cover this again later on, okay? So this is actually, the important thing to note here is what we define here is a function in terms of the nodal unknowns at the three nodes, and this allows us to figure out the X and the Y displacement at every point inside this element, okay? All right, the next step is to um, define the stress-strain relationships and the displacement-strain relationships, okay? 
So this actually goes back to what I was talking about in step zero as far as some of the modeling assumptions, okay? So when we talk about the relationship between strain and displacement, here are our um, strain fields right, in um, uh, two dimensions. I'll just do 2D to make it simpler. So a normal strain in the x and y direction, and then a shear strain in the plane, right? So for small displacement, actually, the way we usually do this is we can express these as derivatives, partial derivatives of the displacement field. And again, we'll cover this in a later chapter, all right? Um, actually, this is uh, an approximation for a very small displacement, actually, in the limit that the displacement goes to zero, right? Um, uh, so if you do have a large displacement, you'll get an error from this. So there are other uh, strain displacement relationships if you do have large displacements, you might have to use something like this, like an Euler uh, uh, Green Lagrange strain type of thing, right? So this is a, another way of doing the measuring the strain. If you linearize this, it resorts, it degenerates down to the small displacement ones, but actually it's valid for large displacement. Okay, so a little outside of the scope of the book, but that's an assumption. Okay, so for the most part, we're going to be using these as our strain displacement relationships. And then the second bit is to figure out what is the stress-strain relationship, or what's the constitutive model, right? Uh, do we have elasticity? Do we have plasticity, right? Is it physical elastic, right? And so how is the stress related to the strain? Again, for most of this class, we're going to use linear elasticity, so it's going to be like a Hookean model. So the stress is going to be linearly proportional through these constants in this E matrix to the strain, okay? okay? But again, this goes back to modeling assumptions. If it's not reasonable to, to have elasticity, if you want to capture a plastic response, you will need to use a different constitutive law or a different strain-stress relationship, okay? All right. The fourth step is to actually derive the element stiffness matrix for one element that you're considering, okay? The element you chose back in step one, all right? So there's three ways of doing this. We'll mostly use the first way, every now and again we'll use the second approach, but one way is we'll do like a direct stiffness approach. So we'll sum forces at the nodes, and this will allow us to get the stiffness matrix. There are other methods, they're quite nice. You can actually write the energy or some other variational principle, and then we can seek to minimize the energy with respect to the displacement and or our solution if you will and you know the solution that's correct is the one that's going to minimize the total energy okay like the Hamiltonian all right and then the third way a much more general way is uh, to use a, a weak form uh, this stands for method of weighted residuals right so this this stands for Okay, so method of weighted residuals. Again, it's a little beyond the scope of this class, but it's a very powerful method in general for solving for all types of PDEs, okay? All right. So what this is going to allow you to do is, for a particular element in your discretization, this will allow you to derive the element stiffness matrix, okay? For one element, all right? Then the next step will be to um, form the global stiffness matrix by assembling the individual stiffness matrices from all the elements in your discretization or your mesh. So that'll populate a global stiffness matrix who has the same number, as the same dimensions as the number of degrees of freedom in your model. So if you have like 20 nodes and if each node has two degrees of freedom, X and Y let's say, that's 40 total degrees of freedom so this stiffness matrix will be a 40 by 40 matrix, okay? All right. All right. Well, let's go. Okay, step six is to solve the system. So now we have a global stiffness matrix and a right-hand side vector to the external forces, and we want to solve for D. 
well, this is going to turn out to be um, a singular system of equations because we haven't invoked um, displacement boundary conditions. We haven't said where it's fixed. So in fact, what we need to do is solve this system KD equals F with a particular bit of displacement boundary conditions. All right. So we'll, again, we'll talk more about how to do that in uh, chapter two, actually. All right. But that's the idea. All right. So that now we find uh, D, the displacement vector, that tells us now at each one of these nodes what is the displacement at x and y. Right. That's our D vector. And then finally, well, almost finally, that allows us to now compute the element strains and stresses. So this is going to actually use our strain displacement relationship to recover the strains from the displacements. And also to use our stress strain relationship to recover the stresses from the strains. Okay, we'll talk about how that's done again in later chapters. And then maybe the most important bit is to actually interpret your results. So now you've got all these results from your final element model. Does this give you the right information to uh, validate your design? Maybe it shows that maybe you're, maybe there's some error in your uh, modeling equations or in your final element model, and maybe you want to revisit the model itself and resolve it. Maybe you see that there's a strong stress singularity somewhere and you want to add more elements, so on and so forth, okay? So that's a pretty important step, and we'll talk more about that. Actually, there's a whole chapter involved in that, all right? So that's the end of this section. I know uh, there's a lot of details that I didn't go over, and again, I apologize for using my notes. I didn't feel like I didn't have the time to make sl slides or go through it explicitly, so I figured I would just use the notes. And I write the notes for myself, not exactly what's in the class, so I think sometimes that's a little bit big but but again you know for this class I need you to memorize uh, these steps and we will use these exact procedure in every chapter even when we talk about the, the, those particular elements okay all right thanks that's it let's see if I can turn this off now stop